South African uh, Chief Rabbi Warren Goldstein uh, released a, a YouTube video a couple of days ago. His response to the International Court of Justice's um, ruling on the South African case of genocide against Israel. And um, I, I watched it and I thought, yeah, he's very powerful, um, well-spoken, a lot of detail. Like, it's only, it's only 14 minutes long, but it's, it's very rich in content. Uh, got to give it to the give it to the rabbi Rabbi Goldstein, um, very well presented, but when it finished, uh, I just didn't feel it didn't feel right. I, I felt uncomfortable, and I thought to myself, self, like why am I feeling uncomfortable? Um, you know, most of what he said, um, well, a lot of what he said made sense, but then some of the things, you know, didn't didn't ring true in my mind. So I felt a bit uncomfortable. Um, I think I think the, the thing that struck me the most, one of the things that came out of it was, would Rabbi Cyril Harris, the previous chief rabbi of South Africa, would he have delivered a speech um, like that? Uh, probably, probably not. I think perhaps he would have been more circumspect. In fact, I don't even think he would have made a video. I don't think Rabbi Saul Harris would have made a video in response to to the the, the ruling of the RCJ. Um, I think the one thing that that it, it wasn't conscious, but then I that's a, I thought about it. This is a rabbi, a man of God, uh, the spiritual leader of the Jewish community in South Africa, indirectly almost calling for war. It's like I don't know. To me. Is it the position of, of, of a religious leader to be to be talking like this? And 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 Rabbi Goldstein like made quite a put a lot of quite a bit of emphasis on how we live in, we in South Africa we live in a vibrant democracy. But then the, there was harsh attacks on the ANC government. Um, most of it actually very warranted, you know, a government, you know, corruption, uh, you name it, it's, you know, guilt, they, yes, valid points. But at the same time, you, 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 you're criticizing the government, the ANC, but at the same time, you, you, are, you are celebrating our democracy. Now, you, you can't... How did this? How did the? You need to be cognizant or acknowledge that the democracy that we are celebrating, that we are enjoying in South Africa, is because of the ANC, predominantly. So yes, we do have a wonderful democracy, but it's because of the ANC. Whether you like, whether you like it or not. So, yes, Rabbi Goldstein made very valid points about the corrupt ANC, but at the same time, I think you need to acknowledge the history from that point of view. Other, another thing that, that struck me as well was, you see, you've got to be so careful. Somebody could give a very good talk and, and say some very good things and be factually correct, but then there could be some, like three or four or five very glaring errors, so to speak in my mind. So it kind of like ruins everything. Um, Rabbi Goldstein pointed out that the Jewish community was in the forefront in the struggle against apartheid. And that's just, that's just not true. You, you can't just make up history. You can't, you can't make up history. You can't make up your own Bobermeisters. It's just not true. Yes, there were members of the Jewish community that were in that were in the forefront on the struggle against the party, but they, but they did not represent the majority of the Jewish community. These these people were actually treated as outcasts. They were treated as pariahs by the Jewish community at the time, if the truth be told. I went to a talk, Dennis Goldberg, one of the Ravonia trialists, he was he was sentenced at the same time with Nelson Mandela, Walter Sasulu, etc to life imprisonment. He was released from Pretoria Central in 1986, 
but then he was um, uh, deported. I think he was deported to Israel. That was the deal. I think the South African government made a deal with Israel at the time, if memory serves me correct. And then subsequently, um, he, he settled in England after that. I don't know how long he spent in Israel. I went to a talk of his when he released his book. Dennis Goldberg wrote a book about his life, about his struggle, the Ravonia trial, all that history. I went to a talk at a Jewish community hall and somebody asked him, at the time in 1960, 61, how did the Jewish community react to, to you um, during that, that troubled time? He said, he said very clearly, we were pariahs. We were outcasts. The Jewish community rejected, they alienated um, Dennis Goldberg at the time. So now, you know, our Jewish community, our leadership predominantly, turns around and wants to take credit for the struggle against apartheid. And it's just, that, that is a myth. That is just made up. So it's not true. It's not true. I can only give an example from my point of view. You know, one rabbi, I'm not going to pick on one rabbi. The rabbi at, at my synagogue, at Marshall, when I was growing up, his sermons, his talks, were ne they were never, ever political. I don't, I don't know. Were any, any other rabbis in their sermons on a Friday night, were they ever political? And um, it's just, so at the time, our Jewish leadership, our, our rabbinical body, was was apolitical. They did not speak out against the party. They did not. But now, it's interesting. It's ironic. Maybe is, it, is ironic the, the right word? Now we, we at a time now it's twenty twenty four. Now suddenly our rabbinical body, our leader, our chief rabbi, he he can get political because he's got the freedom to get political. Do you not, you know, you've got to acknowledge the irony. You've got to acknowledge the history. And that's, the, you know, that's the way I, the way I see it. Um, then, then the other thing that stood out to me was this reinforcement of this belief that South Africa is a proxy to Iran. And I, Rabbi Goldstein basically said that um, there's, there, the journalists are investigating the link between Iran and South Africa, in this case Iran, backing the RCJ case, the case of, of the South African team going to the International Court of, of, uh, of Justice, that this was backed by Iran. And he alluded to the fact that our foreign, our foreign policy, South Africa's foreign policy, could, have, could very well have been captured. Now, this, the, here is the thing. It's a very good possibility that he's correct. It, there's a chance that this is correct. I'm, I'm sorry to say, it, it is possible after whatever has happened in, in our past, arms deal, guptas, state capture of, of our state entities, it is possible. But you've got to word it carefully. You've got to say, I suspect, you know, I'm suspicious that I, there's a possibility. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense that after... Our Minister of Foreign Affairs or Foreign Relations, now Lady Pondor, went to uh, Iran and then soon after her return, suddenly South Africa's got a case of genocide against Israel. So yes, it, it raises red flags, and yes, it could very well be true, but we don't know that for, for a fact. So besides the, the speech that Rabbi Goldstein gave on YouTube, I will put this, put this on this uh, YouTube link of mine. But then I saw a very, inter a very interesting clip by uh, Rebecca Davis from the Daily Maverick. 
Rebecca Davis, senior journalist from the Daily Maverick. And she pointed out, yes, there are a lot of prominent, well-known South Africans that are saying that um, South Africa's foreign policy has has been captured. Well, she didn't use those words, but but then she but then she said, you know, they questioned the ANC spokesperson, they questioned some other ANC person, and the ANC are in denial. In other words, as a journalist. Rebecca Davis is saying, we cannot say for definite, we do not have proof. You have to have proof of this state capture of our foreign policy. You have to have proof. So Rebecca Davis is not completely discounting it. She's not rejecting it completely. But she's saying, you know, as a journalist, you when you've got a story, you, you need to have conclusive evidence. So I'm assuming the Daily Maverick and other uh, journalists are, are working on that. And the other and, and the other case is uh, the Jerusalem Post, as Rabbi Goldstein pointed out, that the Jer Jer Jerusalem Post did a story implicating, I think, three different banks. I think First National, APSA, and Standard Bank of creating banking platforms for Hamas. I don't know if. I don't know if the Jerusalem Post stated it definitely as fact or whether stating that there's an investigation to see if this is true. So Rabbi Goldstein said that he, he wrote, he emailed he, the CEOs of these banks saying that please provide evidence that this is not the case. He's invited them to have a meeting with him to discuss this. And I don't know. Uh, to me, it seems arrogant. You are the religious leader of a of a, a very very tiny minority of people, Jewish communities between forty and fifty, may maximum sixty thousand people in South Africa, less than one percent of the population, and you you expect these CEOs to to come for a meet to come for a meeting to discuss these allegations. To me, it's a bit arrogant. But then again, in the context, you know, the South African Jewish community, we punch way above our, our weight in terms of economic activity. So I suppose if the, the leader of the Jewish community uh, sends this invitation to have a meeting, I suppose if you're the CEO of a bank, you will take notice. But again, but it's just, it just gives me a sense of, of arrogance. Look, I don't like doing this. I don't want. I don't like doing this criticism of of our chief of our chief rabbi uh, Warren Goldstein. You know he's, you know he's a well respected. I, I respect him. His credentials are remarkable. Legal degree, rabbi. Did a PhD in Bibli I think PhD in biblical studies. You know he's a highly educated, intelligent person. But on this podcast. You know, I'm just gonna give my opinion. Just give my. Opinion. I'm not saying what I'm. What I'm saying may not be written in stone. I might be wrong as well. I'm just giving you something to think about. Another point that Rabbi Goldstein emphasized quite a lot was: this is not 1938 Europe, Germany. The Jews of today are stronger. We've got a strong army. We have strong supporters around the world. But yes, on, that is correct, and that's wonderful, and I'm grateful. And we are very lucky to be living in these times as the Jewish community in the world. But then you've got to look at the other side of the coin. Yes, it's not 1938. There isn't this anti-Semitism of 1938. It's 2024. So we've got to be very careful when we just jump to the anti-Semitic conclusions. Yes, of course, there's anti-Semitism, but yeah, it's not 1938 anti-Semitism. It's 2024. It is a very different world. One of the other things that Rabbi Goldstein put a lot of emphasis on is that Israel has a right to defend itself. Of course, of course. You know, not, and I've said this before, October the 7th, the October the 7th massacre made, made me ill. It was, it was horrendous shocking, just absolutely disgusting. And Israel needed to respond. 
I'm not a military expert. I don't live in Israel. I mean, I'm sitting here in Johannesburg in the comfort of my, my study. Who am I to, 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 to really judge it? I, I'm trying not to, to, to come across as too judgy. It's more of like, you know, this is an opinion piece. So I'm trying to think, could there have been an alternative? And what's going on now in Gaza, to me, when I watch the news, it doesn't look like Israel defending itself. It looks like we are murdering and attacking the, po the, the populace of Gaza. That, that's what it looks like to me. And eradi eradicating uh, Hamas and killing Hamas and getting rid of Hamas, everyone, most people, most, most in the Jewish community, most of the Western world, agree this is a thing to do. But I don't know if that is it. We, 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 can't, we can't think emotionally. We've got to think strategically. We've got to think intelligently. Is it going to work? Benjamin Netanyahu and Rabbi Warren Goldstein said, think that we're going to wipe out Hamas, we're going to get rid of Hamas. But you know, even I know that, that we're never, ever going to get rid of Hamas. It doesn't work. That we, you can't get rid of Hamas. Hamas is not a, a, a structured, organized entity. It's a, it's a belief. It's a philosophy. It's an ideology. Every bomb that explodes in Gaza, every family that we killed, every child that is orphaned in Gaza is just building and strengthening Hamas. I've said it before. How do you make a terrorist? How do you make a terrorist? Take their house away. Kill their parents. Don't let them work. Take their food away. Take their water away. Take their electricity away. That's how you make a terrorist. Whether you like it or not, Israel is indirectly creating a fertile ground for Hamas to grow and, <clears throat> and spread and get, and get larger and bigger. <coughs> And there won't just be Hamas in Gaza. These actions, and I know that, 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 that Chief Rabbi Warren Goldstein and the Jewish community and the Israeli Defense will think, think that they're actually protecting the rest of the diaspora, think that they're protecting the Jewish community by trying to get rid of Hamas. No. In my opinion, you indirectly, you're endangering the Jewish community further around the world. You are, you are creating more so-called Islamic fundamentalism. You are angering and festering this deep-seated hatred and revengefulness. I don't know. I don't know what is the solution, Damon. Somebody sent me a, a comment: "This is war, Damon. It's not. It's it's not war anymore." To me, it just looks like a massacre. Well, how is it going to? How is it going to end? It doesn't make sense. Like, how will the, the Israeli Defense Force know when they've gotten rid of Hamas? How will they know when Hamas is no longer? How will they know? I, I call me naive. Call me. I'm living in a fantasy. May, I'm being um, idealistic. But there has, there has to be a better way of defeating Hamas. There's got to be another way. And history will tell us, whether you like it or not, a military solution is not going to work. At the end of the day, a diplomatic solution will work. Well, got a chance of work, working. I'm not saying it will, that'll work either. Probably, probably not. I think this is something that's never, ever going to be solved. But I just think that the current actions are just making things worse and worse, in my, in, in my opinion.